As artificial intelligence tools like ChatGPT take over the workplace, knowledge workers are increasingly concerned that the technology could eventually take over their jobs. But what if instead knowledge workers leaned in on the technology and learned how to use them more effectively? We're, uh, could could that provide workers with more valuable skills in their careers? We're going to chat about that next up on Today in Tech. Hi, everyone. I'm Keith Shaw. Welcome to Today in Tech. Joining me in studio is Jim Chilton. He's the executive vice president and CTO at Cengage Group. Welcome to the show, Jim. Yeah, Keith. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Can you uh, give a little quick background of what Cengage Group does and, and, and how you guys are related in the, the technology and education space? Yeah, so we are a global education and technology company, and um, we are about $1.5 in revenue, and we're made up of all kinds of learning components. Most people are familiar with us from higher education mm -hmm. and think about us as a hundred year old text publisher, but we are also um, part of the National Geographic Learning Brand as one of our K-12 brands, but we also own a cybersecurity company called InfoSec Institute and a business unit called Ed2Go mm -hmm. and a business unit called Gale, which is library and research services. So basically when you think about learning, in just about every way imaginable, that's what we do. We help people learn things. Right. So everything from K to 12, but then also in the, in the Skills. sort of, uh, yeah. worker space, like yeah. the knowledge worker space. Exactly. Um, and so, uh, education is being affected by artificial intelligence and chat GPT tools mm -hmm. and generative AI. Um, can you give me a little bit about like, how has that landscape changed over the last, uh, eight months since, uh, chat GPT was announced? I think it's profound in the sense that this is the first technology that really has the power to fundamentally shift how we think about education and teaching in all of those modalities, in all of those areas, right? So whether you're going to teach cybersecurity or whether you're going to teach economics or whether you're going to teach biology, is that this has the power to really change that. And what we're seeing is Two things. One, we saw that initial visceral response as people pushed back immediately, right. right? We saw people ban the technology. And worst case was it was some public schools even. Mm -hmm. you know? So the mm -hmm. very people that are deprived from technology in the first place, let's shut them off. I mean, so it made <laughs> no sense to me. And so I think what we see is an openness by leading institutions and leading schools and leading instructors who are open to the idea and see this as a technology that could help augment and deliver what they do in a better, more meaningful way. And I feel like there's some other people who are really fighting it. And what we really see is that when you think about learning in general, right? There's this principle around Bloom's theory of two sigma mm -hmm. and um, other ed education technology leaders have talked about this, but is that this principle basically says that if you take two examples, one in the classroom, okay. one instructor to students, and a one-on-one -on -one tutoring experience. You get two sigma difference on the one-to-one -one tutoring experience. So the outcomes are exponentially better. For the tutoring. For the tutoring right, experience. Right, right, the one-on-one. -on -one. Exactly. Yeah. And so this technology, when built properly, has the ability to really create that in the classroom-like setting. So when you think about what we're trying to do and the way we think about it, it has the potential to take an average student in almost any discipline and make them excellent. Make an excellent student mm -hmm. brilliant mm -hmm. because you can actually change the outcomes by enabling and supporting critical thinking and supporting analytical thinking and not just giving answers to questions. Right, right. are you seeing different companies sort of take that approach of where we'll just integrate ChatGPT or some other generative AI and just give you the answers mm -hmm. um, versus maybe more of a tutoring approach? Exactly right. And yeah. I think this is where our Cengage group is that our position is somewhat unique so far in the sense that there is less value in just getting the answer, uh -huh. right? And so when you think about that in your own personal experience or anybody's, right, is that if you, if you just get the answers to the questions, you really don't know the how or the why, you just know the answer to the question, right? That's not going to enable critical thinking. And when you think about furthering your education or even furthering your employment, at some point, people will be able to peel away at the layers of what you don't understand, right? So I think this is not actually helping people. It's, it may help them through that exam. It may help them through yeah. their homework assignment. It is not going to help them in truly learning material. Do you find that AI has that ability to sort of not just give an answer, but then also explain the answer. I'll, I'll give you an example if you want to hear. Mm -hmm. um, back during the the pandemic, um, uh, some of my kids were taking some online classes through this virtual school setup that we had. And uh, if 
they didn't know the answer to a question. They went to the site called Brainly. Yeah. I'm sure you've heard of, mm-hmm. of Brainly. Uh, and we would find some of the answers to the quizzes, but, but usually it was just the answers and there was a code word that would say like, right. okay, this is, this is the answer to the test. But then I started going on Brainly and um, some of the math questions that people were asking, mm-hmm. I would then go in as a sort of a human yeah. and go, this is the answer, but here's how we got to that answer yeah. and sort of write out these long explanations to try to help these students that were looking up the answers right. to sort of explain this is how we got there. Uh, do you see that AI could eventually do that or is Absolutely. it doing it now or, or yeah. not? I'd say that it's not doing it now naturally. I think that if you asked it to, so mm-hmm. if you asked for the answer and then you asked it, how Ex- did you come explain how you yeah. got to this? So if you think about calculus, if you think about algebra, think about things, it will explain, same with writing code. It will explain to you how it got there if you ask. Mm-hmm. I think when we think about it is that we intend to build and create things that are very targeted towards that end so that when you think about true tutoring, it's about helping developing the learning, not just giving the answer. So we will lead with the instruction, just exactly the way you described, lead with that up towards the answer so that the student or the learner is getting the answer, but also getting that step-by-step, how did you get here? Right. And so for us, I say we flip it around a bit. And when we think about it is that having a fine-tuned model specifically on a discipline or a specific area of subject expertise and really diving deep there so that when you or your students or your children are engaging, that it is on that specific topic and what are the ways that I can help you really learn this material, not just kind of, I give you the answer because right. sure, you could give anybody the answer. Right, right. And how is this different from some of the sort of the visual learning uh, trends that came out? Because it felt like when you were, when we were looking at education for a while, um, you would see like video instructions, uh, things like Khan Academy, yep. um, where they would then have like a whiteboard example. And and for a lot of math questions, I've got, I've got two teenagers and yep. they struggle with math sometimes. So if they're struggling with a concept and I can't really explain I'll go go on YouTube and look up, yeah. and then there's usually a couple of teachers that will do things like that, and they'll show you an example. And it's usually different from how their teachers have sort of approached mm-hmm. it. Can can we then meld in AI so that they're back to sort of reading, or do you see that maybe somehow AI will get involved with some sort of visual aspect as well? I think it has the potential to be both. Yeah, and I think it's really going to be up to the creators of what tools and technologies you put on top of these, and I'll be specific around generative AI models and LLM models. Mm -hmm. What you build on top of that, I think has the power to do exactly what you've described. Um, I think it's gonna be up to us. And you think about some of those people on YouTube that are helping your children understand it, right? This is part of the example, right? Some of the best instruction and professors and teachers in the world care enough to do that and are actually, it's at their passion to be able to deliver this. It's not just about like, just how do we get through this, right? And so I think for me, that's the part that we really want to embrace. And I think this technology has the potential to do that and not do that. I think it's going to be largely up to us to decide how is it in, how is it developed upon and how is it deployed? All right, I'm going to come off on another yeah, tangent yeah. because you just made me think yeah, of something yeah. else. The, the space where they need more help mm. is in that sort of home repair or uh, <laughs> auto repair types of things. Because I'll type in things on YouTube like, uh, you know, a plumbing issue that I've been having. Like, how do I get this one piece off? Mm-hmm. And then the the, the videos that the, these people are producing yeah. – all of a sudden they just come at it with like, these are the seven tools you need and yeah. do this and this. And like halfway through, I'm like, I can't do this. And then I end up calling a plumber for, yeah. for help. Yeah. Um, I, I, I wish that, that there was a way we could sort of get to that point, maybe with generative AI or, or something that yeah. could help me rather than having me call the plumber. But yeah. that's, that's sort of an offshoot. I want to, I want to like switch. That. Yeah. I want to switch gears to the, uh, the, the knowledge worker space. There's a lot of stories come out uh, about how generative AI and the impact it's going to have on knowledge workers. Mm-hmm. And of course the headlines all scream, Oh, AI is going to take your job and blah, 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 blah. And, you know, get ready for this or, and again, that, that sort of fear, unknown and doubt type yeah. of thing. Um, but I, but I do feel like that knowledge workers should embrace sort of the technology and learn more about it. Do you, do you see, you know, do you have a position on should they embrace this technology or should they sort of be fearful of it? And you know, how much risk is there out there? Is it, is it just headline screaming or is it, is it a real impact and a real risk? I mean, I think it, it's a little of both, Mm -hmm. you know? And so I think for me is that I think everybody should be embracing it regardless of where you are. You know, when you and I started this conversation around 
writers, content creators, mm -hmm. graphic designers, et cetera, right? I think to, regardless of your profession, I think people should be embracing this. And I think some, I can see where some people would be fearful of it for the obvious examples that have been plastered all over the news, right? right? But I do think like any other technology we've seen before, it's society's obligation to kind of jump into it and embrace this and then figure out how do you use it as a tool to accelerate that work that you do, right? There's examples already of things that would take you know, marketing campaigns that trickle down and would take months to do, they'll now be able to do in a few hours, right? So that's an acceleration that is possible that wasn't possible before. And when you think about, you know, I like the example of the calculator or even, you know, um, um, I remember going through um, quantitative math. <laughs> okay. Right? And quantitative math, when I took it in college, right, is that I could use a calculator, but I couldn't use any software tools. Okay. And in our semester, we got through maybe three or four major case studies. Now, when my daughter took it, who just finished college a few years ago, she had 50 or 60 case studies. And the reason why is because she has allowed to use software, right. allowed to use tools. Now, who do you think has a better understanding of quant right. today? Me or my daughter? Yeah. My daughter does. Yeah. And I think it's the same thing here. Is I think people have to be open to how could you use this as an accelerant? And then how do you think about next iterations of jobs? Because on the other side of the question you ask is not what jobs will still be impacted, is also what jobs will be created right. as a result of this. Right. And that sort of leads me to the next question is like, what steps should knowledge workers take? Like if, if can they sort of, if you assessed your job, you'd be like, would my job be in danger of something like that? Like, am I doing the same thing over and over and over and over and over again? Then at some point, if you were, you'd be like, yeah, I, I think I should probably look more into how to use these tools to, to make a better job or look for mm -hmm. a different job that utilizes these tools. Like what, what should be the first steps? Yeah, I think for me, the first step is always curiosity. Yeah. Right. I mean, I think people have to be open to this. The worst thing you could do right now is stick your head in the sand and pretend this is not happening. And we've seen that across our industry and a lot of people like, let's assume legislation or government or somebody's going to step in and, and, and stop this. Mm -hmm. This is here. It's not coming. It's already here. Right. And I think being curious about what the power is, what you could do with it and how you could use it as an accelerant. So again, take graphic design with Dolly and things that have been built upon this. You could say, this could replace the graphic designer. I don't know. I think it could accelerate the amount of work that graphic design departments produce. Right. You know, and being competent in those tool sets would actually provide more resume building material for you to have for your next job. Right. If you think about the person that says, I'm only good at the Adobe suite of creating this, and I've never looked at anything outside of that versus the person that is proficient in the Adobe suite and is now proficient in AI-based tools, right. who do you think is getting that job? Yeah. Right? We know that. So I'd say, I would encourage people to be, be curious, experiment, go test it in your world. To, to your plumbing example, right? <laughs> is that really go out there and you'd be surprised the amount of information that's available out there, whether you're going to try to change that four barrel carburetor from 1985, or whether you're trying to fix a plumbing problem, experiment in all areas. Right. There's, there's no boundaries in my mind about what we could learn about learning from this. Right. And, and in terms of sort of the generative AI stuff, that means like learning how to write a proper prompt. And, you know, so, you know, the, the term is prompt engineer. And I think you and I, before we, we, we were recording this, we kept joking that when Google came out, there was no such thing as a search engineer or a Google, in, you know, well, there probably was Google engineers, but, you know, it, it's weird that they've now come up with an official title for a job that might not even exist yet. But I do get people asking me, hey, you know, how do I use ChatGPT? What can I do with it? What are some of the ways that that prompts? And th there's stuff out there. And I, I will say, like, learn how to write a prompt and, yeah. you know, experiment, you know, and, and you'll see that different different descriptions, uh, especially with the the writing tool and with the the image tool, like yeah. um, Stable Diffusion and, yeah. and Mid Journey and things yeah. like that, the more detailed you get, sometimes it, the AI just forgets some of the things uh -huh. and you're going down a wrong path. But sometimes the vague stuff, yeah. It's like draw me a picture of a cow with a with a birthday hat on, and then you're you're allowing them to sort of make these decisions. So it can go either way. I, so that's one of the things that they should learn, right? Is just sort of how to write a prompt. Exactly. Yeah. And I think that being clear enough in the prompt when you think about just the persona that you want the generative AI model to take on, you mm -hmm. know, I think that's probably one of the most valuable part of prompting is to be clear. Like, what do you want them? Do I want pretend you're a plumber? 
Pretend you're a senior coder. Uh -huh. Pretend you are a writer. Pretend you're a graphic artist. I mean, so when you prompt we're giving them a role, it allows them to dial in, how do I think about how I'm going to respond to these questions? If you've asked it to be a web designer, it's very different than if you've asked it to think about being a plumbing or electrician specialist, right? So that context, I think, really, really helps. Yeah. And I, so I, I do think getting proficient at prompting, and I do think over time, we'll rapidly see that where personas will exist on top of these tools pretty quickly that are sure will be commercialized, but prompts that will allow people to dial in certain personas. Right, right. And and so as you're looking at the AI space, are you finding that there are things that AI still can't do in terms of this, this traditional sort of teaching education, um, you know, learning model that we have is is there stuff that that can it, it can augment it but there is still a place for a student and a teacher oh absolutely yeah right i mean to me this is a supplement to, to teaching and it will not supplant it it will not replace it in my opinion and that is not just a short-term statement it's a long-term statement i believe there is value um that is provided today by teachers of all subjects that will continue because again and where does, where does that value come from? Is it the experience that the teacher has? Uh, if the teacher as a human can sort of determine whether the student understands it? Yeah, exactly right. It's, it's almost the emotional or yeah. the, the, the connection that they have, right? right. And I think that's, it's the honesty that comes with it, right? If, depending on the age that we're talking about, people are, in some cases, very interested in understanding critical thinking and analytical thinking. In some cases, people are just trying to get through it, right? People all learn mm -hmm. in different ways, right. whether visual learners, as you described, different types of learners. I think a professor pulls out those differences and allows you to dial in how can you inspire that student, right? Each of us have teachers and professors in our past lives that help inspire us and bring the best out in us. I think that happened to a lot of people. If you remove that, it is 100% on your shoulders to self-assess and self-determine both your proficiencies and your deficiencies. I'm not sure most people are up for that. Yeah. To, then to be able to engage with a virtual model about your deficiencies and your proficiencies, not sure people are ready for that type of engagement. I think professors really have this opportunity to really focus in on the how and the why and what is happening and what are you learning about and why does it matter? Right. And how did we get to these places? I think those really matter in almost all disciplines. And you're using the word professor a lot. So we're talking about the higher ed space. Can that, can that go down a level to secondary education oh, in high schools and, yeah. and things like that? That can also be, yeah. it, it can work there. I would argue it even more so right? okay. because you think about that experience and engagement at that lower level K through 12 uh -huh. is that I think that's where you see teachers really understanding the students, right? That's, they're having a visual cues and capability on what's happening in the classroom. What's the dynamics of these children? What impact is it having on how they engage and how they learn and where they are struggling and where they're not? There's no automation that's gonna replace that. Right. And I think I would also take it to our skills-based learning. What we do, even with our cybersecurity instruction, our boot camp program, same thing is that as we watch technologists walk into the room, there are some certain people that are far more proficient and ready for our cybersecurity boot camps mm -hmm. than others. And that instructor picks up on those cues and helps navigate what those are. I think this tool has the ability to help the instructor with that next step, not so much with that first step. Okay, I want to swing back to sort of the knowledge worker uh, discussion. Mm -hmm. uh, what are the best ways for companies to sort of enable employees to to become better at these tools? Is it the responsibility of a company to sort of um, recognize that these that these tools are coming and sort of work together with an employee? Or do you think that they're going to be like, all right, you're, you're the employee, we're the employer, you go learn it. I mean, I, that yeah. just seems very adversarial and, and it, it does seem it should be more of a partnership yeah. at some point. I certainly have a point of view and I think yeah. we have some workforce data really that, you know, half of all employees worldwide need to upskill or reskill, right? Th that's before AI, right? So as a general rule, right. that needs to be happening. And yeah. so I think that, you know, people who are providing this choice to their employees, I think are the most leading organizations versus those to your point that say, this is somebody else's problem, mm -hmm. right? So from a Cengage Group perspective, and I think best-in-class companies perspective, they take on the responsibility of what do we do with this? How do we establish some guidelines around what it is, what you should be doing and what you shouldn't be doing? 
where do you share our information? Where don't you share your information, right? So I know that for us, and I'm sure it's not perfect, but we've established a policy and guidelines we've shared with all employees. We have an internal instance yeah. of chat GPT or Cengage GPT, as we like to call it, that is tailored around us and our culture and encouraging all the employees right. in the company to participate in it. We're very clear about what you should and shouldn't do there. Don't take your 1040 tax form, <laughs> stuff it in there and say, was there a better return for me, right? So right. it's just being clear to your point about yeah. guidelines of what you can do. But right now, all 4,800 employees at Cengage have the opportunity to engage in a safe environment that we've created for them yeah. that is not out in the public. Do you, do you think that, that that same sort of fear is what a lot of companies did? Like the, it, it was almost, we talked about in the education space where initially there was this fear of, oh, we're going to shut it down. We can't use it. We don't want you to cheat. Yeah. Um, do you think there was something similar in sort of the corporate office worker type thing of like, we don't really want you to use this because we don't know about its accuracy. We don't know about the bias and we don't know, we shouldn't put it out there. Like there were a couple of companies, for example, in the PR space that had uh, uh, chat GPT write some press releases. Mm -hmm. uh, in the media space, there were some that wrote stories and they were obviously like, it's sort of like they crossed the line. And so a lot of companies pulled back and says, no, this is not what it's going to be used for. Um, do, do you, did you find similar things in other sort of corporate, like there was an initial fear and say, nope, nope, nope. And then once they learn more about it, then they're like, okay, now we, un we get it. I, I think it's a little of now we get it. Yeah. I think it's also the inertia behind the employees in the base. So what, one of the examples we have some research shows us too that some 90% of developers today are using one of these tools or a variant of these tools for code snippets. Now, if you look at just that from mm -hmm. a legal perspective and so on, people would be like, I'm hesitant about being able to allow my programmers to do that. You're going to have to navigate around that because the inertia of developers are already headed down that path. So I do think that there is this this interest in what you can do with it and then deciding how it fits. So when we thought about how our employees would engage with it, we knew it was happening already. We had employees come from some of our business units like Milady, which is cosmetology and saying, hey, we could advance our work, mm -hmm. my, my work, right? So take it down to the individual. I can do my job faster using this tool than without this tool. And our response was love that. I want you to use our internal versus external. Right. So it was really about that delineation between let's be thoughtful about what you can do on the outside. And here's the risk that you're taking on by using this open platform that everybody on the planet has access to and right. the risk that you're bringing to yourself. And by the way, the risk that you're bringing to the company. So don't take our copyrighted material and provide it to everybody on the planet by ingesting it. <laughs> right. So that would be a bad idea. Yeah. 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 And so. To your point, just making sure that people understand what are those guidelines? What are the, I would say, guardrails versus policy? I kind of hate the policy word. Okay. Um, that sort of leads me to my next question of, of, of how is Cengage sort of utilizing AI tools for their own content and their own sort of platforms? But in addition, you, uh, you guys have the opportunity to almost teach people about AI. Mm -hmm. Like, so, so there's two different sort of, um, trends that you can sort of capitalize on one you could use ai in 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 shaping the content yourself but then also all of you know provide start start providing platforms and classes and things like that for knowledge workers that might be looking to do this in like how do i use chat gpt in sales how do i use it in marketing how do i use it in accounting that kind of thing exactly right yeah and so when we think which one do you want to talk about first go ahead yeah exactly yeah it's a certain place to try that let me give you some grounding about how we've gone about it and again don't know if this is the perfect approach but this is evolving so quickly yeah. what we've done is we've established kind of an ai center of excellence inside the company that was an assembly of some of our best talent that's focused and interested in this area and has experience with this and we've asked that group to examine five distinct areas and i think these are the right five areas maybe it becomes six over time okay but one is about kind of the commercialization of it for us. So what products would we bring to the market for our customers? Mm -hmm. Another one is about kind of the ecosystem of partners and licensing. So when you think about education and learning, there's an ecosystem. There's all kinds of people that participate in this. And our content may be very interesting to LLMs and others. So there's an ecosystem and licensing thing that we're exploring. Okay. When you think about internal optimization, so when how we explore the best thing we can automate internally, whether it's the ingestion of lots of materials, lots of tickets and problems that we have, how mm -hmm. do we accelerate all the ways we can optimate? We have hundreds of experiments right. and ideas there that we can think about. Then we have the one you touched on, which is awareness and building. Like, 
This has less to do with Cengage specific, but articles that we're posting now, where we're, I use one for a SOC analyst, which is a cybersecurity role, mm -hmm. and where we've gone out and said, if you're in this profession, using these openly available AI tools, here's how you could do your job better. Mm -hmm. We've shared with people in the higher education space that says, we know that this is intimidating time, but here are some tools that will help you check papers that are coming into you and talk to your students about what to do with AI. Right. So we see our role exactly as you described to be helping educate that. And then the final one is how do we establish this foundation to really review the ideas, make this assessment of risk, what is the balance between this? Because the easiest thing you could do in our space would be like, let's take our 150,000 books and all kinds of software that we developed, and let's stuff it into ChatGPT and be like, hey, it's a free for all. Yeah. Every, everybody can always get the answers they're looking for. Yeah. Technically, super easy. Where it fits in learning, not so much. Right, right, right. And then that's the, the discussion that we had at the beginning of the show of, you know, how do you really integrate this as well? Um, I, I like how I came up with two ideas and you guys have five. I mean, that's yeah. impressive. I'll tell you, that's, I, I, it's because I you're in this space. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you guys are in the space. Yeah. So um, were you developing a lot of these, these sort of machine learning and, and artificial intelligence? Were you developing these tools before sort of generative AI and ChatPT made the big headline splash in November? Yeah. Well, I, th I think it's a great question, right? So, yeah. and I think most technologists that I talk to appreciate this is that there really are three things there to talk about. Machine learning, artificial intelligence and generative artificial intelligence. And they are different. And today I know it's become super popular that they're all the same and they're all remarkable. And the reality is they're not. I think that we have been looking and doing machine learning behind um, our products for quite a while. And when you think about assessments and advancements and here's how you did on this particular exam or this particular piece of work, here's where you might wanna focus. Today, people will now call that artificial intelligence. Before, that was basically learning. We've been learning and evolved yeah. how you're doing in your class and what we can do to help you advance and help tell the instructor, this is where Jim is struggling on these topics, right? I wouldn't have called that generative AI before. I still don't. So for me, is that I think we have opportunities to really now advance what we're doing with our products, but in a responsible way to what we are in the business of doing. We, yeah. we, we are a group of learners who want to help learners in all topics. So I, I would imagine that you're a fan of the concept of lifelong learning, like yeah. that whole concept yeah. is that you, yeah. you never really finish learning. And um, I, I'm a believer of that as well. You know, if I had stopped learning about things when I graduated college, I'd still be writing for a news, small newspaper somewhere. Yeah. Instead, I got into a technology uh, media company, learned how to do podcasting and all this other video yeah. stuff. It's so I'm constantly trying to learn. So when when there's a new AI tool, I was like, I want to learn this. I want to. Uh, the only thing I don't want to learn is how to to make a TikTok. That's the one <laughs> thing where I will put my hand up and go, I'm just too old for that. Yeah. Um, but do you do you? So it, it feels like you are a, life, a fan of lifelong learning. Yeah. Um, where do you see this headed? I mean, do you, you know, if do you look at the future of learning and, you know, five, 10, 15 years from now, the whole learning model is going to change or is AI just going to be sort of part of these other things like visual learning and remote learning? And I mean, it feels like remote learning took a, ba a bad hit during yeah. COVID. Yeah, it like, really did. So, so it's hard to predict the future, but where yeah. do you, you see yeah. sort of this being integrated? To your point, I, yeah. I think it is hard to predict the future. I think that two angles I'd look at this. One, from a technology lens, today, I think when people think about their technical, technology ecosystems and what, where AI fits, they swapped out the entire page as if it's AI. It's not, right? Databases will still exist. Mm -hmm. Servers and cloud will still exist, right? It will be a component to a technology mapping to deliver solutions. So I think from a technology map, today it looks like the whole page. I think it will evolve back to a box or a circle on the page of all technology things. On what it can do in our space, I think is really going to be determined by how society engages with it, how legal implications like we're seeing out of the EU start to talk about the right. responsibility behind it. And I think there will be this opportunity for us to, as a society, leverage this as a tool to really improve how fast we learn and to level education, right? So if you think about that just for a split second is that when you think about education and learning across the world, not across the states, there is real acceleration in certain student advancement when you compare 
European students, mm -hmm. to students of Asia, mm -hmm. to students of the US. This has the opportunity to really equalize that if we let it. Right. And so I think for me, there's this opportunity to really leverage that. So when you fast forward, I think the idea of kind of the world is flat, you know, stick a Freakonomics term, but yeah. is, is that with this world is flat opportunity, I think we can level out, level out learning for all of our early learners. Right. So try to get us to a space. I think that will lead to advancements that we yet don't understand. Um, I think the key part of this as well, like we've seen with social media, is that I think there will be more responsibility that needs to be taken down to the Sam Altmans of the world and others, not just to pick on him, but just the easiest name to pick on, right. is just like we saw in social media, there needs to be some responsibility taken about what happens with this, right? Right now, people look at this just like they do with search results as this is fact, right. this is truth. Right. I think we have to get very clear very early about what is fact, what is resources that are built up so that when I'm giving that answer about this, I am saying, here's the source. Mm -hmm. This is why you can count on this as being right. factual and accurate versus this is some source that we're not sure actually where it came from. Right. And we have no idea the accuracy of the fact base of this. So I think there's going to be that. Well, yeah, the thing that concerns a lot of people, especially in, in this whole accuracy space, is that sometimes these large language models will just make up stuff. Mm -hmm. And when you catch someone, when you, when you catch one of these tools doing that, you go, okay, we got to take a step back and like, this is not true. Yeah. Um, I, I had an example of the other day. I, I was asking a question of, of chat GPT. I was using the Bing search engine. I was always, I was wondering if any, uh, any rookie that was drafted in any sports league right. had ever brought their team to the championship in their first year. Um, and I typed it in the, the question I typed in was, you know, basically that, you know, yeah. has there, and, and chat GPT went like, like that. It was like, yeah, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. And then it gave me more of a description mm -hmm. And it said he was drafted in 1969 and he won the title in 1971. I go, that's two years. Yeah. That's not that. So that's, it's incorrect. Yeah. And I sort of scolded mm -hmm. the, 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 yeah. I said, that's not too, you know, that's not his first year. His first year he didn't win. Mm -hmm. Cause I went to the article that was sourced yeah. and the article said, yeah, 1971. But yeah. for some reason that this large language model assumed that it was only one year. Yeah. And after I scolded it, all it did was apologize yeah. to me. It was like, oh, sorry. Yeah. Like, okay, well, wait, you got to do more than that. <laughs> <laughs> well, this, this goes back to me. You remember Wikipedia in the beginning? Yeah. Right? I mean, the whole idea that this platform is like, anybody can edit this thing to try to get to a level of accuracy. And so I think this is why, particularly when it comes to learning for us, is that we are very dialed in onto this fine-tuning notion of saying, I want to make sure that those that we are offering are fine-tuned into the content that we're specifically stating. So when I say to you, this tutor we're offering you or this technology we're offering you is dialed into the specific discipline or this specific book that I can look you in the eyes right. and say, this is its source of information. It is not using all this other random information that may or may not be accurate. I want to be able to say, this is its, this is its code base of understanding. Right. That's all it knows. Right. So if you remove all the ambiguity from all the other learning, then I think that for me is where the technology and the tool gets super interesting. Today with its splattering of 10 million users and all kinds of random sources of pirated data and all kinds, God knows where the information came from. That to me is interesting intellectually as a human being. But when it comes to, I'm going to give you a product and give you experience and look you in the eyes and say, yes, this is the fact base you can count on. I want to make sure that we've dialed in that technology, we've tested it and validated it. And I think that part to me is the most important. When you get that right, yeah. and all of a sudden, then you go back to how we started this conversation, all the disciplines that we cover, all of a sudden now you have a really powerful technology because then I can do it by book, by discipline, by skills area. So I can do this for pharmacy technician, allied health, cybersecurity, SOC analyst, and you can do it with some consistency in what it is and knowing that you're providing the truth, not just an assembly of data that yeah. has been combed across the web. That leads me sort of to my last question was that your platform, I was doing some research on all the different sort of uh, careers and jobs and skills that you guys uh, have, have sort of your fingers in. Um, cosmetology, oh, yeah. IT security, uh, dental assistant. Yep. And so are you seeing that AI can be sort of used? Now, it wouldn't be the same. Exactly. It wouldn't be the same AI. So are you seeing yeah. a world where there's multiple AIs out there mm -hmm. that are all tweaked for that specific sort of learning? 
Exactly right. Yeah. Exactly how I see it. Is it's that like, happening now or is that something that's going to happen sort of down the road? I think it's something that's going to happen pretty quickly. I yeah. think we can evolve through this technology. I think determining right now is which technology is best served for what you just described, where in the same ideally technology platform, we can teach someone about cybersecurity, cosmetology, and Mancuse economics and <laughs> use the same platform, right? Yeah. But, but not have that so confused that if the cosmetologist asked about Mancuse economics, it would say, I don't know what that is. Right. Right. Today, right. if you use a lot of the tools that are out there, using your Kareem Abdul-Jabbar example, yeah. you could be midstream on your economics exam, midstream on your economics homework, and you could jump off to 16 other topics. You want to dial learners into, yeah. you're here to talk about this. Let's yeah. put you in a box because this box learning will keep you from going way off the Right, right. My cosmetology professor or teacher is not going to know about uh, dental assistants exactly. or how to, how to, you know, fix a molar. Yep. And I don't know if the AI is there yet. It, it, it does feel like I there's this general AI that yeah. idea. Yeah. Um, but I don't even know if we're going to get to that general, you know, that's the, the big issue of general intelligence versus mm -hmm. sort of specific AI intelligence. And that's why I'm, I'm not worried too much about sort of AIs taking over the world yeah. because at least us as humans, we can multitask and, yeah. you know, you and I could talk about sort of this topic, mm -hmm. but I'm sure you have interests outside of that. And so, and I do too, I could talk about video games and yeah. I could talk about comic books and movies and things like that that, you know, yeah. I do in my off time. I'm, you know, I don't know. What, what do you do in your off time that like you could talk to me about oh, geez, for another yeah. five minutes? Okay. Actually, yeah. I mean, in, in I don't want to make any assumptions about you. If you yeah, want to no. talk about comic books, go yeah, ahead. No, no. It's, um, <laughs> I, I think for me, I'm, I'm a huge family guy. And I think that um, four children out of college now is that I'm enjoying that portion of my life. And yeah. I'm still um, a very active athlete, or at least I like to think so. And so I stay super active. But I think for me, when I think about intellectually, where do I go, is that so much of the work that I do, I really enjoy. So taking one of the investments we've made in a company called Dreamscape Learn around virtual reality, yep. I think is also an area that's super interesting, not around AI, yeah. but when you take this notion of how can a classroom learn together in a virtual space in a world that they may never go to, it goes back to the spirit of you and I the first time we went on a field trip. Right. Right. When you think about a field trip, you remember it. You remember, where, you remember where you went, who you were with, right? You remember- It all was the, always about the bus ride. Exactly. It's always about the bus ride. You're like, you remember who you sat with. Yeah. You, and, and it's funny when you- Or, think, the, or the lunch cafe that exactly. you had. Exactly. Like. And so you think about it, 20 years later, 30 years, you remember these things. Right. And the reason you remember it is because it was an immersive experience. Now you take everything we've talked about and then you add immersive experience to that. That's where I get like over okay. the top okay. excited about yeah. like, what could this mean to- truly learning and enabling people to advance. Because imagine if we took 50 field trips and they had a little bit more education and a little less bus ride. <laughs> imagine that what we could take out of that, right? Yeah. That would be so cool. And I think for me, that's the type of stuff, oddly enough, I guess I'm nerding out, is that I get excited about those things, even in my private life, because those two things, and it's a guy who spent 25, almost 30 years in technology. These two things are so exciting about the potential they have, yeah. both for Sengage Group, but society at large, and the good that can come out of them, and what we have to do to make sure that we're responsible to limit the bad, because the bad exists. Right. We're going to have to be really responsible very quickly about how do we navigate that, um, because I think yeah, with all technology, there's good and bad. You got to hold. So you're you're probably you're you're pro VR and the metaverse that isn't necessarily dead and yeah. there's there is still opportunities out there for sort of VR environments. I think for me is that I yeah. love and we talked about this at my prior employer a bit, but I think that when you think about spatial computing, I would prefer that. And yeah. I love that Apple. Oh has, yeah, I was going to ask you about Apple. Yeah. Apple has revitalized yeah. that term. Is that spatial computing? I think is very different than when you think about VR. VR, people think about an individual experience where you are falling into an environment, typically around gaming. Mm -hmm. Where I love what DSL has done is Dreamscape Learn has taken an entire classroom and their professor into an experience. So you and I and our avatars are all in there together. Completely different experience. And then when you go to spatial computing, all of a sudden now you are taking the environment we're in plus the environment of others simultaneously. Now you're really starting to talk about all kinds of different things that can happen because of that environmental shift. Um, and I think that for me is where we watch this with Google Glasses, you watch this with other things, right? We, we've tiptoed around this notion of the convergence of AR and VR and what it could do. Mm -hmm. um, 
I think we are now on our way towards this idea of could spatial computing be, and I love the idea of the hand gestures, right? If you pick up on the hand gestures, all of a sudden now, you know, you think about how we pinch and zoom on our screens and the idea that we could scroll and move hands in the future with our eyeglasses on and that will create an experience or open up an application on our eyeglasses. That for me is super, super powerful. Again, with the acceleration of learning. Right. Go back to our curiosity is that if you could make a hand gesture now and on your glasses pops up something that allows you to search and engage as you and I are talking going, I know there's a fact I want to share with Jim. Let right. me do a hand gesture and boom, it's right. literally scrolling. Right. You would think about the advancements that we would be able to make. I mean, that's the type of stuff where I think I get downright I guess I did. I nerded out on you. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I don't want to ask you any sort of questions like, are you guys working with Apple or things like that? But I'm assuming that the, the Vision Pro in, in that announcement um, was probably very interesting to you in terms of how that could be applied to sort of educational uh, yeah. endeavors. Yeah I, think, yeah, I think any of them can be. I love, I love what they've come up with because I think spatial computing goes beyond VR in the sense that essentially, and if you listen to them, is that, you know, that becomes your iPad of the future, yeah. which I don't think anybody was thinking. You think people, people were thinking like, oh, it's a, <clears throat> a revised version of the Oculus or a better, more expensive headset. When you see that as actually your computer 10 years from now, yeah. that's when I think people are like, oh, I didn't really think that's what you meant. So I'm going to have glasses that, so I won't have an iPad. I won't have a laptop. I'll actually use this to do email and check things and work, and they'll actually be embedded in my headset. Right. That is a mind shift that is really different for people. Imagine your example of the the field trip. Mm-hmm. Um, most of the when you when you hear about sort of the VR in, in the education, and we're way off on topic. Yes, yes, sorry, yeah, I, I, I didn't um, know you hear this VR yeah. classroom situation, and it's usually just a bunch of kids in the classroom, and they're all got the headset mm-hmm. on. And it's like I don't know if I want my kids learning like that. But now imagine you take them on a field trip, mm-hmm. and then at the field trip they're at the museum they're at the wherever the the zoo or whatever yeah. sort of they're doing and then they put on sort of the yeah. augmented version of something like that and now now not only are you seeing and experiencing but now you're actually taking in more sort of learning experiences I think that's sort of exactly I, right. I like that future yeah. because then you also still get the bus ride. Yeah, exactly right. <laughs> and, so, and then when you take when you take what's happening with Dreamscape Learning, the deployment at Arizona State University, is that they've had some forty five hundred students already go through this for biology. Yeah. Keep in mind though, it is three twenty minute sessions over an entire semester, right? So it is a, even that is an augmentation to the learning of biology, right? You're going into this alien zoo environment, you're taking in specimen samples, mm-hmm. you're studying that environment, then you're coming out of that virtual environment, going back to the classroom, doing your analysis, going back out to the field per se, doing more of your testing your hypothesis and validating whether you've collected enough information yeah. about what's going, right? You are taking that real time experience and building it into the overall curriculum. So. Not to be lost on these technologies, but how these technologies, whether it's AI or VR, how it fits into the curriculum of overall learning is the part where it truly becomes powerful. Because that, to me, all the way back to our initial start of this is where we can take that average student and make them excellent, make an excellent student, make them brilliant. And I don't care if it's cosmetology, cybersecurity, automotive technician, or economics, we have the power to do it in all those places. That's right. where this gets really exciting. Well, now you've got me, like, I want to go out and learn so much more stuff about everything now. Absolutely, man. Yeah, yeah. All right, so just to bring it back to the knowledge yeah. workers, you, you really do feel like they should lean in on, on this technology, right? Absolutely. All right, cool. Without hesitation. All right, we're out of time. Thanks, thanks yeah. uh, Jim, for joining us on the show today. That's all the time we've got on the show today. Thanks for watching. I'm uh, Keith Shaw. Uh, be, be sure to subscribe to the channel. I'm, I'm going to start this over, Chris. Is that all right? Okay. All right. That's all the time we've got for today. Uh, Don't forget to like this video, subscribe to our channel, and uh, add any comments you have below. What's your favorite uh, way of learning? And uh, join us every week for new episodes of Today in Tech. I'm Keith Shaw. Thanks for watching.